The Magician's Nephew, Chapter 7 and 8 Chapter 7 What Happened at the Front Door Now, slave, how long am I to wait for my chariot? thundered the witch. Uncle Andrew cowered away from her. Now that she was really present, all the silly thoughts he had while looking at himself in the glass were oozing out of him. But Aunt Letty at once got up from her knees and came over to the center of the room. "'And who is this young person, Andrew, may I ask?' said Aunt Letty in icy tones. Uh, d "'Distinguished foreigner, v v very important p p person,' he stammered. "'Rubbish,' said Aunt Letty. And then turning to the witch, "'Get out of my house this moment, you shameless hussy, or I'll send for the police.' She thought the witch must be someone out of a circus, and she did not approve of bare arms. "'What woman is this?' said Jadis. "'Down on your knees, minion, before I blast you.' "'No strong language in this house, if you please, young woman,' said Aunt Letty. Instantly, as it seemed to Uncle Andrew, the queen towered up to an even greater height. Fire flashed from her eyes. She flung out her arm with the same gesture and the same horrible-sounding words that had lately turned the palace gates of charn to dust. But nothing happened, except that Aunt Letty, thinking that those horrible words were meant to be ordinary English, said, I thought as much. The woman is drunk. Drunk. She can't even speak clearly. It must have been a terrible moment for the witch when she suddenly realized that her power of turning people into dust, which had been quite real in her own world, was not going to work in ours. But she did not lose her nerve even for a second. Without wasting a thought on her disappointment, she lunged forward, caught Aunt Letty, Aunt Letty round the neck and knees, raised her high above her head as she had been no heavier than a doll, and threw her across the room. While Aunt Letty was still hurtling through the air, the housemaid, who was having a beautifully exciting morning, put her head in at the door and said, If you please, sir, the Ansons come. Please stop here and answer question one. Lead on, slave, said the witch to Uncle Andrew. He began muttering something about incredible violence, really must protest. But at a single glance from Jadis, he began speechless. She drove him out of the room and out of the house, and Diggory came running down the stairs just in time to see the front door close behind him. Jiminy, he said, she's loose in London, and with Uncle Andrew. I wonder what on earth is going to happen now. Oh, Master Diggory, said the housemaid, who was really having a wonderful day. I think Miss Ketterly has hurt herself somehow. So they both rushed into the drawing room to find out what had happened. If Aunt Letty had fallen on bare boards or even on the carpet, I suppose all her bones would have been broken. But by great good luck, she had fallen on the mattress. Aunt Letty was a very tough old lady. Aunt Soften were in those days. After she had some sal volatile and sat there for a few minutes, she said she was there was nothing the matter with her except a few bruises. Very soon, she was taking charge of the situation. Sarah, she said to the housemaid, who had never had such a day before, Go round to the police station at once and tell them there is a dangerous lunatic at large. I will take Mrs. Kirk's lunch up myself. Mrs. Kirk was, of course, Diggory's mother. Please stop here and answer question two. When Mother's lunch had been seen to, Diggory and Aunt Letty had their own. After that, he did some hard thinking. The problem was how to get the witch back to her own world, or at any rate, out of ours, as soon as possible. Whatever happened, she must not be allowed to go rampaging about the house. Mother must not see her. And if possible, she must not be allowed to go rampaging about London either. Diggory had not been in the drawing room when she tried to blast Aunt Letty, but he had seen her blast the gates at Charn, so he knew her terrible powers and did not know that she had lost any of them by coming into our world. And he knew she meant to conquer our world. At the present moment, as far as he could see, she might be blasting Buckingham Palace or the Houses of Parliament, and it was almost certain that quite a number of policemen had by now been reduced to little heaps of dust. And there didn't seem to be anything he could do about that. But the rings seem to work like magnets, thought Diggory. If I can only touch her and then slip on my yellow, we shall both go into the wood between the worlds. I wonder, will she go all faint there again? Was that something the place did to her, or was it only the shock of being pulled out of her own world? But I suppose I'll have to risk that. And how am I to find the beast? I don't suppose Aunt Letty would let me go out, not unless I said where I was going, and I haven't got more than two pence. I'd need any amount of money for buses and trams if I went looking all over London. 
Anyhow, I haven't the faintest idea where to look. I wonder if Uncle Andrew is still with her. Please stop here and answer question three. It seemed in the end that the only thing he could do was to wait and hope that Uncle Andrew and the witch would come back. If they did, he must rush out and get a hold of the witch and put on his yellow ring before she had the chance to get into the house. This meant that he must watch at the front door like a cat watching a mouse's hole. He dared not leave his post for a moment. So he went into the dining room and glued his face, as they say, to the window. It was a bow window, from which you could see the steps up to the front door and see up and down the street so that no one could reach the front door without your knowing. I wonder what Polly's doing, thought Diggory. He wondered about this a good deal as the first slow half hour ticked on, but you need not wonder for I am going to tell you. She had got home late for her dinner, with her shoes and stockings very wet. When they had asked her where she had been and what on earth she had been doing, she said she had been out with Diggory Kirk. Under further questioning, she said she got her feet wet in a pool of water and that the pool was in a wood. Asked where the wood was, she said she didn't know. Asked if it was in one of the parks, she said truthfully enough that she posed it supposed it might be a sort of park. From all this, Polly's mother got the idea that Polly had gone off without telling anyone to some part of London she didn't know, and gone into a strange park and amused herself jumping into puddles. As a result, she was told that she had been very naughty indeed, and that she wouldn't be allowed to play with that Kirk boy anymore if anything of the sort ever happened again. Then she was given dinner with all the nice parts left out and sent to bed for two solid hours. That was a thing that happened to one quite often in those days. So while Digger was staring out of the dining room window, Polly was lying in bed, and both were thinking how terribly slowly the time could go. I think myself, I would rather have been in Polly's position. She had only to wait to the end of her two hours. But every few minutes, Diggory would hear a cab or a baker's van or a butcher's boy come round the corner and think, here she comes, and then find it wasn't. And in between these false alarms for what seemed hours and hours, the clock ticked on and one big fly, high up and far out of reach, buzzed against the window. It was one of those houses that get very quiet and dull in the afternoon and always seem to smell of mutton. Please stop here and answer question four. During his long watching and waiting, one small thing happened, which I shall have to mention, because something important came of it later on. A lady called with some grapes for Diggory's mother, and as the dining room door was open, Diggory couldn't help overhearing Aunt Letty and the lady as they talked in the hall. What lovely grapes, came Aunt Letty's voice. I'm sure if anything could do her good, these would. But poor, dear little Mabel, I'm afraid it would need fruit from the land of youth to help her now. Nothing in this world will do much. Then they both lowered their voices and said a lot more that he could not hear. If he had heard that bit about the land of youth a few days ago, he would have thought Aunt Letty was just talking without meaning anything in particular, the way grown-ups do, and it wouldn't have interested in him. He almost thought so now. But suddenly, it flashed upon his mind that he now knew, even if Aunt Letty didn't, that there really were other worlds and that he himself had been in one of them. At that rate, there might be a real land of youth somewhere. There might be almost anything. There might be fruit in some other world that would really cure his mother. And oh, oh, well, you know how it feels if you've been hoping for something that you want desperately badly. You almost fight against the hope because it is too good to be true. You've been disappointed so often before. That was how Diggory felt. But it was no good trying to throttle this hope. It might, really, really, it just might be true. So many odd things had happened already, and he had the magic rings. There must be worlds you could get to through every pool in the wood. He would hunt through them all, and then mother well again, everything right again. He forgot all about watching for the witch. His hand was already going into the pocket where he kept the yellow ring when all at once he heard a sound of galloping. Please stop here and answer question five. Hello, what's that? thought Diggory. Fire engine? I wonder what house is on fire. <gasps> Great Scott, it's coming here. Why, it's her. I needn't tell you who he meant by her. First came the handsome. There was no one in the driver's seat. 
on the roof, not sitting, but standing on the roof, swaying with superb balance as it came at full speed round the corner with one wheel in the air, was Jadis, the queen of queens and the terror of charm. Her teeth were bared, her eyes shone like fire, and her long hair streamed out behind her like a comet's tail. She was flogging the horse without mercy. Its nostrils were wide and red, and its sides were spotted with foam. It galloped madly up to the front door, missing the lamppost by an inch, and then reared up on its hind legs. The hansom crashed into the lamppost and almost shattered into several pieces. The witch, with a magnificent jump, had sprung clear just in time and landed on the horse's back. She settled herself astride and leaned forward, whispering things in its ear. They must have been things meant not to quiet it, but to madden it. It was on its hind legs again in a moment, and its neigh was like a scream. It was all hooves and teeth and eyes and tossing mane. Only a splendid rider could have stayed on its back. Please stop here and answer question number six. Before Diggory had recovered his breath, a good many other things began to happen. A second hansom dashed up close behind the first. Out of it, there jumped a fat man in a frock coat and a policeman. Then came a third hansom with two more policemen in it. After it came about 20 people, mostly errand boys on bicycles, all ringing their bells and letting out cheers and catcalls. Last of all came a crowd of people on foot, all very hot with running, but obviously enjoying themselves. Windows shot up in all the houses of that street and the housemaid or butler appeared on every front door. They all wanted to see the fun. Meanwhile, an old gentleman had begun to struggle shakily out of the ruins of the first hansom. Several people rushed forward to help him, but as one pulled him one way and another another, perhaps he would have got out quite as quickly on his own. Diggory guessed that the old gentleman must be Uncle Andrew, but you couldn't see his face. His tall hat had been bashed down over it. Diggory rushed out and joined the crowd. That's the woman, that's the woman, cried the fat man, pointing at Jadis. Do your duty, constable. Hundreds and thousands of pounds worth she's taken out of my shop. Look at that rope of pearls round her neck. That's mine, and she's given me a black eye too, what's more. That she has, governor, said one of the crowd, and as lovely a black eye as I'd wish to see. Beautiful bit of work that must have been. Gore, ain't she strong then? You ought to put a nice raw beefsteak on it, mister. That's what it wants, said a butcher's boy. Now then, said the most important of the policemen, what's all this here? I tell you, she began the fat man when somebody else called out, don't let the old cove in the cab get away. He put her up to it. The old gentleman, who was certainly Uncle Andrew, had just succeeded in standing up and was rubbing his bruises. Now then, said the policeman, turning to him, what's all this? Waffle, poppy, chalk, came Uncle Andrew's voice from inside the hat. None of that now, said the policeman sternly. You'll find this is no laughing matter. Take that aft hat off, see? This was more easily said than done, but after Uncle Andrew had struggled in vain with the hat for some time, two other policemen seized it by the brim and forced it off. Oh, thank you, thank you, said Uncle Andrew in a faint voice. Thank you. Dear me, I'm terribly shaken. If somebody could give me a small glass of brandy. Now, you attend to me, if you please said the policeman, taking out a very large notebook and a very small pencil. Are you in charge of that there, young woman? Look out, called several voices, and the policeman jumped a step backward just in time. The horse had aimed a kick at him, which would probably have killed him. Then the witch wheeled the horse round so that she faced the crowd and its hind legs were on the footpath. She had a long, bright knife in her hand and had been busily cutting the horse free from the wreck of the hansom. All this time, Diggory had been trying to get into a position from which he could touch the witch. This wasn't at all easy because on the side nearest to him, there were too many people. And in order to get round to the other side, he had to pass between the horse's hooves and the railing of the area that surrounded the house, for the Ketterley's house had a basement. If you know anything about horses, and especially if you had seen what a state that horse was in at the moment, you will realize that this is a trickyish thing to do. Diggory knew lots about horses, but he set his teeth and got ready to make a dash for it as soon as he saw a favorable moment. A red-faced man in a bowler hat had now shouldered his way to the front of the crowd. 
Aye, policeman, he said. That's my horse that she's sitting on, same as it's my cab, what she's made matchwood of. One at a time, please, one at a time, said the policeman. But there ain't no time, said the cabbie. I know that horse better than you do. Take an ordinary horse. His father was an officer's charge in the cavalry, he was. And if the young woman goes to excitin' him, there'll be murder done. Here, let me get at him. The policeman was only too glad to have a good reason for standing further away from the horse. The cabbie took a step near, looked up at Jadis, and said in a not unkindly voice, Now, missy, let me get at his head and just you get off. You're a liddy, and you don't want all these roughs going for you, do you? You want to go home and have a cup of tea and lay down quiet like. Then you'll feel ever so much better. At the same time, he stretched out his hand toward the horse's head with the words, Steady, strawberry, old boy, steady now. And for the first time, the witch spoke. Dog, came her cold, clear voice, ringing loud above all the other noises. Dog, unhand our royal charger. We are Empress Jadis. Please stop here and answer question seven. Chapter eight, the fight at the lamppost. Oh, Empress, are you? We'll see about that, said a voice. Then another voice said, three cheers for the Empress of Colniatch. And quite a number joined in. A flush of color came into the witch's face and she bowed ever so slightly. But the cheers died away into roars of laughter, and she saw that they had only been making fun of her. A change came over her expression, and she changed the knife to her left hand. Then, without warning, she did a thing that was dreadful to see. Lightly, easily, as if it were the most ordinary thing in the world, she stretched up her right arm and wrenched off one of the crossbars of the lamppost. If she had lost some magical powers in our world, she had not lost her strength. She could break an iron bar as if it were a stick of barley sugar. She tossed her new weapon up in the air, caught it again, brandished it, and urged the horse forward. Please stop here and answer question eight. Now's my chance, thought Diggory. He darted between the horse and the railings and began going forward. If only the brute would stay still for a moment, he might catch the witch's heel. As he rushed, he heard a sickening crash and a thud. The witch had brought the bar down on the chief policeman's helmet. The man fell like a ninepin. Quick, Diggory, this must be stopped, said a voice beside him. It was Polly, who had rushed down the moment she was allowed out of bed. You are a brick, said Diggory. Hold on to me tight. You'll have to manage the ring. Yellow, remember, and don't put it on till I shout. There was a second crash and another policeman crumpled up. There came an angry roar from the crowd. Pull her down, get a few paving stones, call out the military. But most of them were getting as far away as they could. The cabbie, however, obviously the bravest as well as the kindest person present, was keeping close to the horse, dodging this way and that to avoid the bar, but still trying to catch Strawberry's head. The crowd booed and bellowed again. A stone whistled over Diggory's head. Then came the voice of the witch, the witch, clear like a great bell, and sounding as if for once she were almost happy. Scum! You shall pay dearly for this when I have conquered your world. Not one stone of your city will be left. I will make it as Charn, as Felinda, as Sir Lois, as Bromadon. Please stop here and answer question nine. Diggory at last caught her ankle. She kicked back with her heel and hit him in the mouth. In his pain, he lost hold. His lip was cut and his mouth full of blood. From somewhere very close by came the voice of Uncle Andrew in a sort of trembling scream. Madam, my dear young lady, for heaven's sake, compose yourself. Diggory made a second grab at her heel and was again shaken off. More men were knocked down by the iron bar. He made a third grab, caught the heel, held on like grim death, shouting to Polly, go! Then, oh, thank goodness. The angry, frightened faces had vanished. The angry, frightened voices were silenced, all except Uncle Andrew's. 
close beside Diggory in the darkness. It was wailing on. Oh, oh, is this delirium? Is this the end? I can't bear it. It's not fair. I never meant to be a magician. It's all a misunderstanding. It's all my godmother's fault. I must protest against this in my state of health, too. A very old Dordeshire family. Father, thought Diggory. We didn't want to bring him along. My hat, what a picnic. Are you there, Polly? Yes, I'm here. Don't keep on shoving. I'm not began Diggory, but before he could say anything more, their heads came out into the warm green sunshine of the wood. And as they stepped out of the pool, Polly cried out, Oh, look, we brought the old horse with us, and Mr. Ketterly, and the cabbie. This is a pretty kettle of fish. As soon as the witch saw that she was once more in the wood, she turned pale and bent down till her face touched the mane of the horse. You could see she felt deadly sick. Uncle Andrew was shivering, but Strawberry, the horse, shook his head, gave her cheerful whinny, and seemed to feel better. He began quiet for the first time since Diggory had seen him. His ears, which had been laid flat back on his skull, came into their proper position, and the fire went out of his eyes. "'That's right, old boy,' said the cabbie, slapping Strawberry's neck. "'That's better. Take it easy.' Strawberry did the most natural thing in the world. Being very thirsty, and no wonder, he walked slowly across to the nearest pool and stepped into it to have a drink. Diggory was still holding the witch's heel, and Polly was still holding Diggory's hand. One of the cabbie's hands was on Strawberry, and Uncle Andrew, still very shaky, had just grabbed on to the cabbie's other hand. Please stop here and answer question 10. Quick, said Polly, with a look at Diggory. Greens! So the horse never got his drink. Instead, the whole party found themselves sinking into darkness. Strawberry neighed. Uncle Andrew whimpered. Diggory said, that was a bit of luck. There was a short pause. Then Polly says, oughtn't we be nearly there now? We do seem to be somewhere, said Diggory. At least I'm standing on something solid. Why, so am I, now that I come to think of it, said Polly. But why is it so dark? I say, do you think we got into the wrong pool? Perhaps this is charm, said Diggory, only we've got back in the middle of the night. This is not charm, came the witch's voice. This is an empty world. This is nothing. And really, it was uncommonly like nothing. There were no stars. It was so dark that they couldn't see one another at all, and it made no difference whether you kept your eyes shut or open. Under their feet, there was a cool, flat something, which might have been earth and was certainly not grass or wood. The air was cold and dry, and there was no wind. Please stop here and answer question 11. My doom has come upon me, said the witch in a voice of horrible calmness. Oh, don't say that blabbled uncle andrew my dear young lady pray don't say such things it can't be as bad as that uh cabman my good man you don't happen to have a flask about you a drop of spirits is just what i need now then now then came the cabbie's voice a good firm hearty voice keep cool everyone that's what i say no broken bones anyone good well there's something to be thankful for straight away and more than anyone could expect after falling all that way now if we've gotten down some diggings, it might be for a new station on the underground. Someone will come and get us out presently, see? And if we're dead, which I don't deny it might be, well, you got to remember that worse things happen at sea and a chap's got to die sometimes. And there ain't nothing to be afraid of if a chap's led a decent life. And if you ask me, I think the best thing we could do to pass the time would be to sing a hymn. And he did. He struck up at once a harvest Thanksgiving hymn all about crops being safely gathered in. It was not very suitable to a place which felt as if nothing had ever grown there since the beginning of time, but it was the one he could remember best. He had a fine voice and the children joined in. It was very cheering. Uncle Andrew and the witch did not join in. Please stop here and answer question 12. Toward the end of the hymn, Diggory felt someone plucking at his elbow, 
and from the general smell of brandy and cigars and good clothes, he decided it must be Uncle Andrew. Uncle Andrew was cautiously pulling them away from the others. When they had gone a little distance, the old man put his mouth so close to Diggory's ear that it tickled and whispered, Now, my boy, slip on your ring. Let's be off. But the witch had very good ears. Fool! came her voice, and she leaped off the horse. Have you forgotten that I can hear men's thoughts? Let go the boy. If you attempt treachery, I will take such vengeance upon you as never was heard in all the worlds from the beginning. And, added Diggory, if you think I'm such a mean pig as to go off and leave Polly and the cabbie and the horse in a place like this, you're well mistaken. You are a very naughty and impertinent little boy, said Uncle Andrew. Hush, said the cabbie. They all listened. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from which direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth itself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune, but it was beyond comparison, the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. The horse seemed to like it too. He gave the sort of whinny a horse would give if, after years of being a cab horse, it found itself back in an old field where it had played as a foal, and saw someone whom it remembered and loved coming across the field to bring in a lump of sugar. God, said the cabbie, ain't it lovely? Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness, the next moment a thousand, thousand points of light leaping out, single stars, constellations, and planets, brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds. The new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen and heard it, as Diggory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves that were singing, and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. Glory be, said the caddy, I'd have been a better man all my life if I'd known where this thing's like this. The voice on the earth was now louder and more triumphant, but the voices in the sky, after singing loudly with it for some time, began to get fainter. And now, something else was happening. Far away and down near the horizon, the sky began to turn gray. A light wind, very fresh, began to stir. The sky in that one place grew slowly and steadily paler. You could see shapes of hills standing up dark against it. All the time, the voice went on singing. There was soon light enough for them to see one another's faces. The cabbie and the two children had open mouths and shining eyes. They were drinking in the sound, and they looked as if it reminded them of something. Uncle Andrew's mouth was open, too, but not open with joy. He looked more as if his chin had simply dropped away from the rest of his face. His shoulders were stooped, and his knees shook. He was not liking the voice. If he could have got away from it by creeping into a rat's hole, he would have done so. But the witch looked as if, in a way, she understood the music better than any of them. Her mouth was shut, her lips pressed together, and her fists were clenched. Ever since the song began, she felt that this world, the whole world, was filled with a magic different from hers, and stronger. She hated it. She would have smashed the whole world, or all the worlds, to pieces if it would only stop the singing. The horse stood with its ears well forward and twitching. Every now and then it snorted and stamped the ground. It no longer looked like a tired old cab horse. You could see now well believe that its father had been in battles. The eastern sky changed from white to pink and from pink to gold. The voice rose and rose till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightest and the most glorious sound it had yet produced, the sun a rose. Diggory had never seen such a sun. The sun above the ruins of Charns had looked older than ours. This looked younger. 
You could imagine that it laughed for joy as it came up. And as its beams shot across the land, the travelers could see for the first time that this sort of place they were in. It was a valley through which a broad, swift river wound its way, flowing eastward toward the sun. Southward, there were mountains. Northward, there were lower hills. But it was a valley of mere earth, rock, and water. That was not a tr there was not a tree, not a bush, not a blade of grass to be seen. The earth was of many colors. They were fresh, hot, and vivid. They made you feel excited until you saw the singer himself, and then you forgot everything else. It was a lion, huge, shaggy, and bright. It stood facing the rising sun. Its mouth was wide open in song, and it was about 300 yards away. Please stop here and answer question 13. This is a terrible world, said the witch. We must fly at once. Prepare the magic. I quite agree with you, madam, said Uncle Andrew. A most disagreeable place, completely uncivilized. If only I were a younger man and had a gun. Garn, said the cabbie. You don't think you could shoot him, do you? And who would, said Polly. Prepare the magic, old fool, said Jadis. Certainly, madam, said Uncle Andrew cunningly. I must have both the children touching me. Put on your homeward ring at once, Diggory. He wanted to get away without the witch. Oh, it's rings, is it? cried Jadis. She would have had her hands in Diggory's pocket before you could say knife, but Diggory grabbed Polly and shouted, Take care! If either of you come half an inch nearer, we two will vanish and you'll be left here for good. Yes, I have a ring in my pocket that will take Polly and me home. And look, my hand is just ready, so keep your distance. I'm sorry about you he said at the cabbie, and about the horse, but I can't help that. And as for you two, he looked at Uncle Andrew and the Queen, you're both magicians, so you ought to enjoy living together. Old your noise, everyone, said the cabbie. I want to listen to the music. For the song had now changed. Please stop here and answer question 14. <laughs> 